Welcome back. It's another episode of The Baseline. Nick McCarville here, and we're crunching the numbers at the Australian Open like never before. Dr. Marka Reed, we've got some numbers to crunch with Stan Wawrinka and Roger Federer. Yes, we do. So let's look first at their Australian Open numbers. What do they tell us as far as attacking the ball goes? Yeah, look, we've identified a new way of measuring attack. What we've done is summed the winners, unforced errors, double faults and aces, and then represented that as a proportion of both players' performance on those measures. So what we've got here is a graph that describes the players at the Australian Open, Federer, Vavrenka, and their two opponents in the fourth round, their performance or how well they attacked during each match of the Australian Open. Above 50% represents attacking tennis. The more I'm away from that line, the more attacking I am. Below 50%, I'm more defensive. Okay, so we saw in Roger and Stan's matches that they were above that threshold while their opponents sunk below, right? Yeah, so consistently above throughout the event, which makes this contest intriguing. Okay, so interesting there, but let's look at their head-to-heads. We've got data from four out of the last five times they've met on tour, and what does that data suggest as far as attacking tennis goes? Look, we know Bavrinka's record against Federer coming in 0-14 on hard courts. But what we've plotted here is again that same measure. The further he is above that 50% line, the more attacking Vavrinka is. And we see that in that 2014 final. That trend continues through to the 2015 French encounter where Stan took care of Roger in straight sets. Through to the two more recent encounters on hard court where you can see Roger beginning to match Stan for attacking tennis. So interesting out of that 2015 Roland Garros quarterfinal, Stan attacking at his ultimate best, and what was Roger unable to do? Couldn't break serve. No breaks of serve from Roger Federer. First time since, I think, 2002 that he was unable to wow. do that in a Grand Slam match. Wow. So let's turn to the serve, should we? And let's look at when the pressure goes up, how well do these guys deliver, especially on the first ball? We all look at Roger and think how clinical he actually is on that first serve delivery, right. and that's what the numbers show. Both players, first serve, speeds go up when the pressure builds. Okay. Roger, however, distinguishes himself from Stan because he begins to target the line that much more than Stan does. Okay, so we talk about that first serve delivery, but let's talk about the return of serve, particularly on the second serve. What are these guys doing differently, and how does that help or hurt them on court? Yeah, look, it's an intriguing comparison. Roger's all about taking away time and space for the opponent, and that's what we see on first serve return. Stan assuming a similar position. On second serve, Stan sets himself back. Stan's all about trying to generate high ball speed off that second serve return. Okay, so now what's very important for these guys is the serve, obviously, but then it's the third shot of the rally, that second stroke from the server once they have the return ball back in play, where do they need to make sure that ball goes to be ahead in the point? Yeah, look, they both want to impose their game styles on the opponents. They want to play attacking tennis right from the outset. Following the serve, the guys are going to be going to the extremities of the court, or at least in tempting to do so. Okay. When they get that done, off the first serve or following the first serve, yeah. have about a 70% chance of winning the point. Okay, so a 70% when you're spreading the court, say, close to the add or deuce line, but what about when you're hitting to the middle of the court and giving your opponent s sort of more of an opportunity to work with the court? It becomes much more of a toss of the coin. So lastly, let's take a look at work rate versus attacking tennis yeah. and what each of these guys have to do but also have to be careful about. And we've talked about work rate throughout the fortnight, how important it is. It captures distance, speed, and our intensity to change of direction. Right. So what we see here, both individuals have got a threshold they enjoy working under. Federer, 300 units per shot. Vavrinka, 310. As soon as they work above that point, they're at risk or greater risk of losing. Okay, so what do we see once Stan is pushed above that work rate, that 300 threshold, what happens to his tennis? There's an interaction or relationship with work rate and yeah. the, my attacking tennis or my brand of tennis. What we see with Stan, he's pushed above that level, he's forced to attack a little bit more. He plays to the limits of his game, if you like. And we see that in the graphic here in that top right-hand corner. Okay, but for Federer, once he's pushed above that threshold, he actually tends to hold back a little bit, doesn't he? Hold back or he just gets uncomfortable. He's not able to okay. generate the same amount of precision on the ball and or speed. So we see the relationship there. He's pushed above 300 units. He moves to the left. So he's 
opponent tends to play more precise tennis than him. All right, lots to think about for Roger and for Stan. Thank you, Dr. Reed, and thanks everyone for watching. Hope you join us again tomorrow right here on The Baseline.